I'm Indy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, our World War II in real-time format where I answer all your questions about the Second World War. Uh, Yaro Katowski asks, How did Alexander Kerensky react towards the invasion of the Soviet Union? Um... Well, those of you who've been with me since the Great War certainly know who Alexander Kerensky is. But for those of you that don't, he was a Russian socialist politician who plays a part in the February Revolution in 1917 that overthrows Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, from July that same year, he heads the troubled provisional government as prime minister until his government is overthrown by the November Revolution. Kerensky manages to flee the Bolsheviks and after a failed attempt to rally forces behind him, exiles himself first to London and then to Paris. Kerensky does not involve himself in the Russian Civil War, supporting none of the various factions. He does openly criticize the Soviet regime though, and remains an outspoken proponent for Russian parliamentary democracy. From his exile in France, Kerensky leads a propaganda campaign against Joseph Stalin, editing the anti-Bolshevik Russian newspapers Dni and Novaya Russia. Uh, he also often urges the Western allies to take decisive military action against both Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany. After France is defeated and occupied by Germany in 1940, Kerensky heads to America. In July 1941, with Germany now pushing into his homeland, he writes a long article in Life magazine. In the article, he analyzes the Soviet position. 23 years after her humiliation at Brest-Litovsk, Russia is confronted with the threat of a gigantic new capitulation and dismemberment. The threat can be parried only if the Red Army can resist till the autumn rains, that is to say, for at least three months. Although he still denounces Joseph Stalin, calling his rule the terrible destruction of my nation's moral and material powers, he does voice support against Nazi Germany. It is in the light of that tragic experience that today, I not only wish the Red Army success, but even stand ready to help the Kremlin as best I can. Every Russian must assume full responsibility before his nation at the moment when her people's eyes are open and they perceive the chasm at the brink of which they are standing. A similar article also appears in the New York Times, that one also calling for the Western democracies of Britain and the US to support Soviet Russia. Nevertheless, Kerensky's offer of his own help is never taken up and he spends the rest of the war in New York City. Now, before anybody writes in, I said the, uh, I said the February Re Revolution and the November Revolution. I should stick to one calendar or the other. I should have either said the March Revolution and the November Revolution or the February and October, depending if I was using the Gregorian calendar or the Julian calendar because Russia back then did not use the same calendar as Western Europe. Anyhow, uh, Aiden F. asks, how were French musicians working during the war? Well, this is a really big topic. To make it manageable, I'm just going to talk about the classical musicians and the really famous popular musicians. Things like jazz music and the resistance music, I suppose we should spend some time on later. We should do specials on that later, guys. Okay, yeah. When France falls in 1940, the fate of many of its musicians becomes very uncertain. Though a lot of classical musicians are actually able to continue their work at companies like the Opera de Paris. See, the Nazis want to woo the French upper classes and have them accept the new regime, so they allow opera houses to keep running. Adolf Hitler even visits the Opera de Paris during his visit in June 1940. However, for propaganda reasons, uh, they stipulate Germanic composers in the opera programs, demanding that the music of Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner be played. Uh, in March 1941, they hold a lengthy festival of German music at the Opera de Paris. They fill the opera with swastikas and, and with German flags and prominent German guests attend the festivities, which of course celebrate the classical works of some of Germany's most famous composers. Philippe Pétain and the Vichy State have ideas along similar lines. They revive famed French composers like Claude Debussy as part of a nationalist music renaissance. Of course, the works of Jewish composers are banned in both the occupied and the Vichy zones, and Jewish musicians are fired. The manager of the Paris Opera, Jacques Rouchet, is forced to fire 30 of his Jewish employees in 1940. 
Being a wealthy man, he continues funding their salaries out of his own pocket until 1942. Some Jews simply continue their work under a pseudonym. The Jewish composer Joseph Kosma, for example, composes the score for the 1944 French film Les Enfants du Paradis with the help of his friend, the poet Jacques Prévert. But one of the grand voices in French music history, well, Edith Piaf's career actually blossoms during the occupation. She often performs in Berlin as well as back in many of the prestigious Paris nightclubs. When the war ends, there will be accusations that she was a collaborator and she will have to testify to clear her name. Luckily for her, after it is revealed, she actually helps some French POWs escape. The accusations are dropped. Um, Charles Aznavour, who will one day be called Francis Frank Sinatra, also assists people in escaping. His family hides many Jews in their Parisian flat. Likewise, Maurice Chevalier entertains with songs promising that everything is perfectly all right under the German occupation while hiding a Jewish family himself. Uh, Przemek Witkowski asks, how did Germans get to Africa in 1940? Well, first of all, I'd like to clarify, although the North African campaign begins in 1940, the first elements of the German Africa Corps only start arriving in North Africa in February 1941. Under the command of General Erwin Rommel, German troops then begin their journey to the African continent. The operation to send them there is codenamed Sonnenblum, something Hitler has had prepared for a long time. Flieger Corps 10 has already been sent from Norway to Sicily, and it seriously threatens British naval dominance in the Mediterranean. This is over 300 German planes viciously bombing both Allied supply convoys and the island of Malta. In the meantime, German soldiers are sent to the Italian ports of, of Naples and Palermo. On February 8th, the first wave leaves in transport ships flanked by Italian destroyers and with German fighters. They arrive three days later in Tripoli, a day before Rommel himself arrives by plane. Now that's mainly infantry units, but there's a second wave of trucks, heavy equipment, and anti-tank guns who are sent not long afterwards. On February 18th, a sufficient number of troops have arrived in Tripoli, and Rommel officially forms the 5th Light Division and creates the Africa Corps the day after. On the 20th, though, a German convoy is seriously threatened as Allied warships open fire. All the ships survive, but one of them has to be towed the rest of the way to Libya. Around the same time, Rommel realizes he needs more tanks. So in early March, the 5th Panzer Regiment crosses the Mediterranean in four transport ships as well. German High Command, in fact, promises Rommel the 15th Panzer Division. This division arrives in two waves in late April and early May, at a time when Rommel has already captured Cyrenaica and has the Allies under siege at Tobruk. Well, that is it for today. But if you'd like to know about the Russian Civil War that Kerensky kept himself out of, you can watch our Between Two Wars episode on that right here. And the reason why I'm able to sit here in my chair of infinite knowledge is because of the amazing Time Ghost Army and the Time Ghost Army support. So join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. And importantly, if you would like me to answer your question, don't just put it in the comments. Post it at community.timeghost.tv. And then it might actually become on, come on this show because if you just put it in the comments, we'll get hundreds of questions and it'll get lost in the shuffle. So uh, somebody else might read it and they might say, hey, that's a great question, but I won't answer it. See you next time.